Hey dudes and dudettes, thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Be Kind and Rewind podcast. A podcast chock full of everything that is nostalgic about the 80s, 90s, and more. Where we chat with our favorite celebrities about our nostalgia-filled VHS days. This episode, I'm joined by the man who's been working in Hollywood since the 90s, where you probably spotted him frantically searching for milk in the Got Milk commercials as tongueless prisoner roach on the uh, people under the stairs, or storm chasing Alan Sanders from Twister among countless other roles to this day. So I welcome character actor guru, Sean Whalen. Hey, how are you everybody? Thanks, Sean. Thanks for taking the time. I really appreciate you uh, coming on the podcast. Uh, I, like I said, mo- most people, are when they see your face, they're going to recognize it from a number of many things that you've, you've probably yeah. been in and to this day and, and back into the 90s. So just kind of jumping in to the podcast itself, you yeah. attended UCLA back in the 80s. Yes, and I did. So what made you pack your bags from your home, home state or hometown of Washington, D.C. and head to head west? Uh, uh, it kind of had to do with money. <laughs> I was the youngest of four kids. Uh, my dad, when he divorced my mom, he made an agreement saying, you know, I'm going to back off on child support, but I will pay for all four years of their college. Well, my sister, uh, he lived out in San Francisco and my brother had just, uh, been in Santa Barbara. So in California at that time, UCLA was so much cheaper. I was focused on theater, so there were two pla- two places I wanted to go back east, either Carnegie Mellon, which is kind of a very straight shot into Broadway, or uh, Catholic University, same thing, or UCLA Film Department, or Acting Department, because that kind of got you into the business. So I, uh, you know, I talked to my dad, and he said, look, you, I'm, you know, I'm a little strapped, I really want you to look at UCLA. I, when when I went out there, I was like, you know, this is awesome to really, really leave my hometown, really get out of there. And it was much cheaper. And I could have transferred back if I wanted to. My brother forced the issue and was like, hey, I want to go to this back east school. And he's like, well, I don't have the money. He's like, yeah, you do. Or, you know, or you're going to have to figure it out because that's why you made your agreement. <laughs> and, and I could have forced my hand to go, but, but I really loved being on the West Coast. So... It, initially it was financial, but then I really loved to, you know, and then I went to Groundlings from there, which, you know, I loved as well. Part of me always regrets, you know, you always say, maybe I would have been on Saturday Night Live if I would have stayed back east or what would have happened if I, you know, went on Broadway and really, you know, I, I can sing a little, dance a little. What if I did that work? So, you know, they're all what ifs, but I can't really complain. Yeah, there's always those what ifs, but it sounds like everything worked out just fine for you. And, and so you already had the acting bug before you went out to California, right? Absolutely. Yeah, I did it in elementary school. I was in the local um, theater group, Santa Spring Theater Group in Maryland. And I was uh, also, so I was doing musicals and stuff with them. And I was doing musicals and stuff in school. And, uh, you know, I, in high school, I just did a lot, a lot of theater. So I was definitely on that path. Well, nice. So it carried over into going to UCLA. And so while you're at UCLA, I'm sure in the 80s, it's, it's littered with, you know, pre-Hollywood elite in regards to actors, directors, <laughs> agents, executives. Did you like happen to have like a roommate or somebody in your class that you're like, oh, I had them in my class? Yes. Uh, my first play was Daphne Zuniga, who is very well known from Melrose Place. Mm-hmm. Was, and Grant Show was also in Melrose Place, uh, who was big at the UCLA Theater Department. So they were kind of the big deals back then. So uh, they're, they're the ones who went on to pretty major success. She was in a Rob Reiner film as well, The Sure Thing, with John Cusack. And uh, so she she's done a lot of work, and Grant Show has been on several shows. So well, cool. Yeah, like I said, I'm sure there's pl- plenty more in your class that you probably didn't yeah. even know of at this point. But yeah, yeah, yeah. the the list probably goes on and on. Um, so then, uh, while going to UCLA, and of course being an actor early on in your career, you, everybody has to take on waiting tables and bartending and things like that. Yeah. So among you know probably a few waiting jobs you had, what was your favorite one? What did you? What was the position you enjoyed the most? I I mean I liked I liked waiting tables at this place called Chin Chin in Brentwood, which was just free featured because it was featured and we lived right there uh, in the 
People versus O.J. Simpson because that's right where everything happened at this restaurant I was. And uh, it was weird because they've changed their whole look and uniforms and everything before that show. They went back to where it looked like when we were waiting tables there. Oh, nice. So it brought a little nostalgia to you seeing it back like that. Oh, my God. It's so weird. But, uh, um, yeah, because Kardashian went there all the time with his kids. So uh, I, I think that was – the funnest, it was the only real waiting job I had. I, I went to one job where, I think it was uh, God, some burger joint, uh, Red Robin. And and the, the shift was so, they said, well, you'll have to start out. And I'd work like two hours and make $10. And I was like, I can't live this way. Mm-hmm. So I started Chin Chin and uh, I just stayed there till the end, till I had to quit waiting tables. Well, nice. And, so you just, had the, you just had the one then most of the time built up my schedule and then slowly, you know, brought it down until I was only, uh, I had one waiter shift that was just a killer shift on Sunday nights where I always made good money. And I kept that for a while after I was working in commercials and things because it was just great money. It was, I thought, all right, I'll just do this shift every Sunday night for rent. So, well, then like you said, as as the the less frequent you do, the better you feel like I don't, I can rely on the acting now as opposed to waiting tables. So it's almost like a fun, almost like a hobby to do your, your Sunday shift at some point. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But it gets really hard because then you're on a set and people are like, Oh, this is great. You're fantastic. You're so creative and you're treated really well. And then the next day someone's like, (laughs) I said I wanted a lemon slice. Yeah. Where's my ketchup? Yeah, yeah. You just happened? you can see the like, dichotomy in your head. You're just like, Ugh. yeah, it was rough. It was really rough. Well, like I said, I'm glad that eventually you got to work yourself out of it and you got to see yeah. the satisfaction of success and things like that. Not knowing where yeah. you came from, what you had to do. Yeah. Those those yeah. stories at the time aren't ever fun, but when you get past them, they're a little bit more of a satisfactory yeah. thing. Look, I tell my student, and I one student just said to me, she goes, "I screwed up. I came into town, got a nice apartment and a nice car, and I was like." Big mistake. Mm-hmm. I said I live with four dudes in a two bedroom, sleeping on an air mattress, walking to work, taking a bus to class at the ground links. Like you're supposed to. I mean, it's kind of the romance of it. You know yeah, what I mean? It really is. Broke. You know, you're supposed to be broke. You're supposed to give everything to your craft. So uh, when they were not doing that, I thought that's really strange. Like you know, because a lot of my students now I teach and they have really nice cars and I'm like. This isn't the way it works. Man. They're, they're starting a, a two two feet ahead of themselves, I think. Yeah, yeah exactly. Well, exactly. cool, cool. Well, then, so how long into you know doing your work and auditioning did you land? Eventually, land the Got Milk commercials that you know basically launched you know back yeah. launched your career at that point. Actually, the first thing I got, well, the thing that made me stop waiting tables was People Under the Stairs in '91. <laughs> so I, I did that movie first, and it brought in enough money. And I was working enough that I didn't have to wait tables anymore. Okay, so People <laughs> on the Stairs was before the Got Milk the commercials. Milk commercial, yeah. Okay, well, let's talk about that real quick. In every neighborhood, there is one house that adults whisper about and children cross the street to avoid. Now, Wes Craven, creator of A Nightmare on Elm Street, takes you inside. All sorts of rumors about what goes on in that house. The police never took it serious. What goes on under the stairs (laughs) is a nightmare. It is time to clean. Wes Craven's The People Under the Stairs. Quit getting working with Wes Craven, becoming Roach. Like I remember seeing watching that movie a lot on HBO late night as a kid, just like freaked out by by Roach's half tongue and everything like that. So (laughs) you you are responsible for sleepless nights in my life. So thank you for that. But so what was the process of maybe auditioning or landing that role? It was kind of funny because it was just at, at that point I was done with the Groundlings. I was taking some drama classes, and I had a uh, coach. And I really, um, you know, I'd get auditions and I'd go to have him coach me. And when I went, uh, I was like, ah, it's cool. I just crawl around and scream. There's no lines. And he's like, no, there's there's more to it than that. He goes, you have to be likable. You have to understand that, you know, who this guy is and that he got out and the others didn't. But he doesn't leave. He stays there for the girl. And he helped me really work it out. And then, you know, I went into a room 
uh, it was weird. I didn't have an initial meeting with the casting director, um, but I went straight to meeting with West with a bunch of guys who are all wearing tattered clothes <laughs> in a in an audition room. And uh, the opposite we, of what it normally looks like, I imagine. Exactly. <laughs> and you know, my friend, the, my favorite story is my friends were all in graduate school and now looking for their jobs, and they said. Uh, you know, I went on these interviews today and I, you know, always got to wear a suit and you have to briefcase and talk about yourself. I said, yeah, I had an interview today where I was shirtless, crawling around Wes Craven's rug, screaming and crying and hiding behind his desk chair. Uh, and they were like, well, it's more interesting than the shit I get to do. <laughs> definitely. Definitely. Uh, and then that was it. And then, and then I, uh, it was like an hour later, I got the call that I got the part. Wow. So crazy. Yeah. I was really strange, but, uh, that was amazing. He's so great. He just was so nurturing. I got to work with Greg Nicotero, who you know is now huge on The Walking Dead, mm -hmm. the pro producer and, and producer and executive producer on uh, Fear of the Walking Dead, um, very early on in his career. And, and we just had a wonderful, it was just a wonderful, great vibe. We had so much fun. Um, and he just kept the set very friendly very and very artistically pure he wanted us all to live out as truthfully as possible this crazy circumstance so and everyone there was there to do that actually Ving Rames was on that movie mm -hmm. Adams I mean we had re Wendy Roby uh, Everett McGill I mean we had really good actors that played it pretty serious you know it was wacky and weird and fucked up but we played it as real as we could yeah and it's got one of those you know it's a great movie but also has a cult following as well so do you think yeah. the way things are going in hollywood now they're going to try to remake the people on the stairs they did that when when everything was being remade you know mm -hmm. Rob zombie was started with halloween there was obviously a whole slew of people and there was talk but the the last thing before West passed was he wanted to do it as, as a series on sci-fi. And that's where it kind of left off. They were developing it to be a series on sci-fi. And then when he passed, I have no idea what happened to it mm. since. But, yeah. You know. It's in development hell, as they call it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, well, hopefully. And maybe Netflix, the way Netflix works and Amazon and Hulu, it might get picked up by one of those other places. And who knows? It, could, it still could see the light someday. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm way too old for Roach, but I, <laughs> I would love to play like the crazy dad or something. Oh, know? yeah, no, I, th I, they would have to, it would be criminal for them not to incorporate yeah. you one way or another. Yeah, they would do something. They so would cool, do. so cool. One last thing about it. So for Roach's tongue, like how long did it take to do prosthetics or what was that oh, kind of like? Uh, that was really simple. I, I did have to put my tongue into some, uh, uh, like this gel. For a little while, but it didn't take that long. Mm -hmm. um, and then they molded one, and they they fit it, and it was just a sleeve that, that I stuck my tongue in, and I just had to not push my tongue out all the way. It was like a little, very simple sleeve thing that I just slipped on. And what was crazy is I, you know, kept goofing up and talking, and Wes was like, "You can't talk," and so I said, <laughs> "Screw it, just give me the tongue." And I wore the tongue every day, so I couldn't talk anymore. So that made me be able to communicate, but not be able to be understood. So I wore that thing in my mouth the whole shoot. Well, nice. Well, even yeah. though watching it, knowing it's a prosthetic, and now the confirmation from you, still seeing the scene where you put the right in front yeah. of your right in front of your tongue, still is going to get me every time. So it's it's yeah. a great. <laughs> So awful. Great effect for sure. So, uh, well, kind of moving on to some other stuff you did in the 90s. I saw that uh, you played a pa small role, Paperboy, uh, in Batman Returns. <laughs> From the sewers of Gotham, a new villain emerges. You didn't invite me, so I crashed! Gotham looms its greatest hero. Parents, that was amazing. Yeah, so what was that set like? What was it working working on there? 
amazing set that I remember I was on vacation and I was told Tim Burton wants to meet you and I just like I swear I just literally got to my my parents cabin lay down in a hammock I was chilling and then they're like hey you got a phone call you gotta fly back to LA and I was like ah. <laughs> and had a great audition with him and uh, I thought it was, they had me on hold as one of the penguins clowns you know those crazy clowns mm -hmm. Uh, but then they changed up the role, and the set was awesome. Like it was so hot in the summer, and you would walk through refrigerator plastic things, walk into the set, and you're in the huge, huge Gotham City set, you know, uh, of the of the town square. It was massive. The whole stage was this, and it was uh, 32 degrees. So all of a sudden, you you would feel your breath and everything like that. They kept it all really cold. And so everybody's jackets were real, the whole thing. And then, you know, so I got to watch Christopher Walken do his thing. I got to see Danny. Uh, uh, Good old Danny DeVito. DeVito do his thing. Uh, I was thinking, I, I got stuck on Danny Elfman. Uh, well, well, that score was amazing yeah, as well. Yeah, but he, uh, but it was crazy. It was like this humongous set. And I remember I was screwing up my lines the first day thinking, oh, God. What am I doing wrong? And these suits from Warner Brothers were checking their watch. And I was like, oh, fuck. And Tim goes, this is kind of written shitty, right? Say it like this. And I did. And then it fixed it. And Boom. He so cool. And they kept me on the payroll for months because they thought they'd use me again. So I was getting a paycheck for them. Why so my not? are still great to this day because uh, he kept me on the payroll when I saw him at the rap party. Because they said, why are you keeping him on payroll? And he said, because we may use him again. Because he's the newspaper guy, and, and he's kind of our check-in point. Mm -hmm. So when I saw him at the uh, rap party, he's he like, I said, hey, Tim. And he's like, Sean Whalen, the reason that Warner Brothers Accounting hates my fucking guts. <laughs> <laughs> that that hey, was awesome. Hey, with some of those account, the way that accounting happens in Hollywood, they should be able to, be able to hide that, no problem. Yeah, it was fine. Well, cool, I, cool. I, I don't blame and so, uh, of course, you know, Batman was like in the, coming off the first Batman is still like huge. People were anticipating yeah. the second one to come out. Um, what were your thoughts when you saw the whole movie as well? It was intense. It was so intense. It was it was amazing to see. I mean, you know, I thought I still think it's one of Michelle Pfeiffer's best roles. Oh, down. yeah. Best Catwoman all around. Yeah. Well, best Catwoman by far. Uh, and. Danny DeVito, I thought was one of his best dramatic things he's ever done. He was awesome. I mean, it was fantastic. Especially so. with all that makeup on, like the kind yeah, of like they, the, they stepped up that gruesomeness a little bit. Yeah, it was. It was just very cool. I, I really thought it was awesome. It was. It was cool to be a part of that. Oh yeah, of course. Like I said, me being a, a true Batman kid and yeah, taking it out of my Batman mug as it is, it's uh, yeah. Bat Batman Returns is uh, definitely near and dear to my heart. So I just had to get your your two cents on that one. Isn't that weird? They don't have a Batman convention. No, it, they totally should. They totally. Should. All right, that's our new idea. All listeners, boom. You heard us? You never heard us. Co-founders. <laughs> they're gonna. It's gonna be on BuzzFeed. Sean Whalen and Carlos Sanchez starting Batman convention. It's happening. <laughs> But uh, yeah. but you never know. We never know. Who knows? It's probably out there. It's probably like in some like so small Alabama town that we have no idea about or something like that. So it's out there somewhere. But moving yeah. on uh, from good old Batman, uh, you went. Uh, you started worked on Twister in 1996 as Alan Sanders. Even as the seasons change, nature moves within itself, its colossal power and its delicate beauty, in perfect harmony, perfectly cosmically sane though periodically nature will in a kind of psychotic fit go completely randomly mad Um, plenty yeah. to talk about with that. Before you guys started shooting, did any of you do any like ac actual research with like storm chasers, things we, like I that? Did uh, yeah, we did. Uh, I came in a day late for that for some reason, but yeah, they went out with the real guys. But then we hung out with them for a day or two, and I was like, oh, these guys are. Crazy. I was gonna say they're nuts. <laughs> they're nuts, man. They're that they're like nerdy scientists 
Vegas gamblers. Like, you know. Nothing they, to lose. They're just, they're just going for it. They just live for that and they're obsessed with it. Just like a crazy gambler would be, you know. They could not get enough of it. And, you know, the, the, pers- the, the funniest part was them watching a movie. And then they say, okay, you can, you can see it dropping the funnel. And then we see, uh, okay, now we got, now we have debris, which is great. It really lets us see everything. When you see debris and we were like, um, isn't debris cars and houses and <laughs> animals and shit like that? And like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway. And yeah, I was, anyway. The, yeah, that's crazy. And, and so that was really crazy. And then just being on that set was like a traveling circus all over the Midwest. It was, it was nuts, but it was so fun. I mean, I made great friends with, uh, you know, may, may he rest in peace, Philip Hoffman and, uh, Bill Paxton, um, to, you know, losses that suck in any realm, but mm-hmm. just Twister, uh, it was, it's just so strange. Um, and the guy, the guys that I hung out with on the Good Guy team, Wendell Josepher. I'm, I'm in a play right now, and I just saw Wendell. She came to my show. Oh, nice. Alan Fox, who I rode with, uh, he came to my class and spoke to my class. I mean, it was it was great. It was all really really good. And uh, but it was long. It was really long. It was six months. And you know, you're you you might go in and be on a set for 13 hours on a pig farm, and you might get in your truck and drive around for you know four hours and then that's it and then they wait for another shot you know it, it's it was so much going on with that yeah but i it, imagine i got to wreck three trucks i remember i remember like it was halfway through and the guys came up and said listen you got to be a little more aggressive with this truck and i said why because <laughs> they paid for three and we're only using one so they're going to give us a ton of shit at the end of this movie if you don't use all three and i was like i'm down so <laughs> it's like going into ditches and breaking the axle and it's like know. it's like a business surplus like uh we need you to kill two of these trucks immediately or we're not going to get them for next one oh, this is that Uh-oh. we're going to pull the curtain pull the curtain back here folks for a few minutes and you're He's- a real deal in place hey man i'm doing a podcast right now and they're listening to us <laughs> all these lovely listeners yeah wow well i think uh, i think i should yeah, I like Jay Kogan. I like the people and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, they could easily recur. And yeah. And I also think, like, it'll be good to network and see if the, I'd like to bring some of those people to our show. Yep. Let's do it. Bye. That's negotiating in Hollywood. You heard it, folks. It's no negotiating in Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> Take, they, take it as it comes, they say. They say, take it or leave it. So, well, cool. Well, well, like I said, folks, we just we just got the curtain pulled out behind us so we can definitely see how it goes down in Hollywood. I'm going to be doing a, a guest star on the uh, TV show School of Rock. Ooh, so. cool, cool. Uh, yeah. Hey, keep the, li- the list. He's going. Just, the that, list. I, just add oh. to the IMDb. That's just going to be like. Hey, yeah. He's got Thank a Rolodex you. in there. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> well, uh, just the uh, last few things uh, real quick about Twister. You guys shot uh, out in the Oklahoma, across the, the Midwest. Yeah. So, like you said, what was, what was maybe your favorite town or place you guys stopped in? Uh, uh, I really loved Ames, Iowa. Oh, okay. Uh, great. Well, we were in a tiny town of Ponca City, Oklahoma, that was, you know, just a strip with a Walmart and a Burger King and, a, you know, CVS, or, you know, and then there's nothing there and, you know, you'd get stir crazy because we had to stay. Luckily, I worked. A lot of these guys had to stay um, because they just never knew when they were going to need them because we mm-hmm. were always facing bad weather. And whenever there was bad weather somewhere, we'd go shoot there. So we were literally like storm chasing filming the movie because we had to, they wanted to shoot in the worst weather possible always. So um, save that money on the, uh, the posts for yeah, the exactly. effects. So then, yeah, exactly. So then we went to Ames, Iowa, which was a nice college town. University of Iowa is nearby. And, oh, my God, they had really nice restaurants and, you know, some cool independent movie theaters. It's like a like, beacon of civilization in the middle of the Midwest. Oh, oh my God, they know what Romaine was. <laughs> it's really exciting when you've been eating iceberg and they look at you like you're insane. Yeah. 
uh, it was, no, that was, I really liked Ames, Iowa. And I really liked uh, Oklahoma City. We worked in Oklahoma City towards the end. We were working nights, so I didn't get to see much of it. But Ames, I really, I really enjoyed. And then we would drive and do antique shopping and stuff in Tulsa and stuff like that. Oh, those antique shops are a dime a dozen out there on those highways. They yeah. get you to stop in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can get like, uh, I was like, do you want to have a Coca-Cola tin for your wall <laughs> there's seven million of them in, yeah <laughs> in all negotiable as well all you get get the negotiations going at those antique shops so cool well yeah i like i said watched the movie of course growing up in the midwest twister itself made me yeah. my, it may, almost made my parents hate me for how paranoid i was about twisters after watching the movie i was like locked on the weather channel i had our emergency numbers and my backpack kind of a thing so where did you grow up i grew up in emporia kansas uh, which is oh, like an you? hour south yeah. of yeah right in the middle of tornado alley right there so yeah, that so, is scary yeah so storm chasers I definitely met a few of them and they are some different characters for sure so it's like it's like, a, it's like an extreme uh, motorcycle person just in a van or in a SUV chasing yeah. a storm. Yeah, it's nuts. They so, are. They're nuts. They're, they're a they're different nuts. breed. They're definitely a different breed. Well, cool, cool. Uh, yeah, like I said, Twister's always uh, always had a little bit of effect on me to some degree. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, but uh, another classic movie you were you were in, you had a, a, a smaller role in, was you're the heckler and uh, for the yeah. wonders and that thing you do. Guy Patterson didn't have a perfect job ah. or a perfect social life. What's going on down there? Cooking the books as usual, Dad. But what he did have oh. was perfect timing. How about sitting in for Chad just for tonight? Why? Just broke his arm. And in one night... That's too fast, Guy. Slow down! Guy, slow down! Guy Patterson is going to take the wonders... From garage. I almost slugged some girl. She had her eye on my Jimmy. To greatness. Become that thing you do. I can take you doing that thing you do. That thing you do. Which yeah. I still listen to that soundtrack to this day. So yeah. what yeah. was it like working at Tom Hanks as a director and you know those other everybody else as well? It was funny because I went in and he said I wanna well see he was friends with Steven Spielberg and Steven Spielberg loved the milk commercial mm -hmm. and, and so that's how I got into Twister and Men in Black and then I'm sure that's how I got an audition for uh, that thing you do and I went in there and I was being uh, I was doing a, a different role that I knew I wasn't gonna get it was like a, a man an older manager of uh, the car uh, one of the carnivals they go to but I was doing it in a fun way and I just saw his he just picked up a piece of paper and hid behind the paper and I was like oh this isn't this isn't good and like he's not even interested and then uh, then as soon as the they said uh, I finished the scene he pulled down his the paper and he was laughing so hard I was making him laugh because you know you hear the famous Tom Hanks like, oh, uh. <laughs> you know, like, oh my god I'm making Tom Hanks laugh and he loved it and he had me do a couple more things loved it you know it was great it was in and i had so much fun on that with like giovanni ribisi and steve mm -hmm. and tom everett scott like we hung out a lot it was really fun it was that way. i met charlize there and it was her first movie and we i remember down the uh on the uh rap party uh no one would dance and i was like bopping and i saw charlize Pop and we're like, come on! And we went out there and we started the dance floor, and that was one of my fav famous Hollywood stories. Of Charlize and so I. So you got to dance with Furiosa before Furiosa. Exactly. Very nice. We're cool. Yeah, I uh, that, that that movie, of course, like I said, rings uh, near and dear. Uh, did did Steven Tyler ever show up to set just to come watch uh, Live here and there? Did you just happen uh, to look no, back? I remember. Yeah, I remember hanging out. With what did we watch? We hung out, her, just her and I were talking about a movie one day, and she said, hey, I, I have this movie, uh, I, I got the movie we were talking about, like, oh, cool, let's watch it. We just sat in her, uh, in her honey wagon and watched the song. I forget what it was, it was like 12 Angry Men or something like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, she was super sweet. She was, it was a very chill and very fun set. Uh, it was very cool. And, and Tom was, you know, he was very specific and, he was surrounded by really good people too. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It was it was great. I, I 
it's a shame that he didn't do more, I thought. You know, I thought that one was really great. I know he did that other one with Julia Roberts, which I've never seen, but... The one where he went, went back to school, I can't remember what the <laughs> name of it. He yeah. Wrote, wrote, but, but I thought that that thing you do, it did horribly in the box office. Like, it was the worst Tom Hanks movie on record. Mm. And uh, I did the worst, like, Drew Barrymore movie on record and the worst Ang Lee movie on record, but I was like, do I have a terrible streak? And I go, no, no, no. Batman Returns did well. <laughs> and, <laughs> Batman and, held up. Well, you know, but so, but what was weird, they did terrible at the box office, but they're known, you know, they're so well known. Now they hold up, never been kissed. And that thing you do, people watch them all the time. Oh yeah. I never skip it. If I see it on just for the music. And of course, like it's just the, yeah. the, the fun, it's such a funny movie that the lines just keep coming like from Steve yeah. Zahn or when you're, whenever yeah. you're on, on, on screen. So like I, it's a movie that it shouldn't be skipped if it's on. And I'm glad that it got the cult following. Cause that sucks that it, it didn't get the box office didn't need it. But of course, yeah. back in the late nineties, it was the DVD sales that kind of, showed the uh, studios that, hey, there is a, a following for this. The funniest thing was the, uh, was the, uh, uh, when Drew Barrymore, the Never Been Kissed came out. It was kind of at the end of that teen thing. And I remember I was like, we're set up. We're so set up. We're going to do great. And someone was like, well, there's other movies. And I said, who wants to watch Keanu Reeves and some weird computer movie called The Matrix? Nobody. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and we were like blown out of the water by them. So it uh, was. Uh, it well, was I moment. have to admit, I did see both movies. I, I'm a fan of both. I, uh, the Matrix and Never Been Kissed. You were great in that movie as well. I loved your character in that one. Well, yeah. I, get into that real quick. What, like, how did you develop that character? Is that written that way? The way I see it, we are tomorrow. Hello, I'm tomorrow. Because when we get the money and the power, the women come to me. The women come to me. Do what I'm doing. You know, if you ain't moving, no movement. You better write that down. You got a napkin? No, it wasn't at all, actually. It was not written that way. It was a very small one-line part, and um, uh, and it was it was this weird thing where I'm supposed to hand her her message, and I'm picking my nose, and there's a booger on the message or whatever, and uh, uh, they said, you know, my producer, uh, Drew, and her partner, Nancy Javonin, who's now uh, Jimmy Fallon's wife, very cool, said, um, you know, what would you think is funny for this part? Because we don't really know what we want. She goes, we'd like to give you a part, but what do you think is funny? I said, listen, I think it would be funny if the guy thought he was badass and thought he, you know, Armani suits and the headset and spiked the whole, hair was the, was spiked the hair. It off. He thinks he's he thinks he's the shit, even though, you know, he's a copy editor's assistant. Like he's not even. You know, he's he's so not a big deal. Um, he thinks he's on Wolf of Wall Street, but he's... Power is powerful. Total t-shirt, right? Awesome. Amazing. What? Can I get my messages? Yeah. Hey, seriously, last time I saw you, did I act fat? Okay, you hesitated. No, it's case closed. Forget it. You Excuse hesitated. me, Merkin. Um, I noticed that there weren't any index cards, and I can't do my notes hey, without hey, that. Hey, hey, hey. Merkin ain't jerkin. He's working. Okay? Take that to the bank. It's power, baby. It's power. You know, just it. And so that shot of me in the beginning of the movie, the first shot is the first shot in the film. So I came up with all that dialogue. Um, and I thought, uh-oh, either I'm fired or they love it. And Drew was like, I love this stuff. And she even fought for me not to do the thing with the bugger on the hand. <laughs> you know, Good. Get rid of that because it makes no sense for this character. Uh, Sean, she just said, keep writing and run it by us. And we, I did. And my part just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And now I have an entire arc for the entire movie. Yeah. So, that's, that's crazy. Cause you kind of wonder how often that happens too, when a character just kind of starts as a one liner and thanks to the actor's creativeness, it just turns into a full fledged yeah. character. That's definitely besides people on the stairs, my favorite film experience, hands down. It was it was creatively so satisfying. It was wonderful. Do you still keep in touch with Drew Barrymore or anybody else on, on, from that movie? Nancy Javonin and I uh, keep in touch every once in a while, but I haven't talked to Drew in a while. But I'm very good friends with the guy who wrote it, Sandy Isaac. I'm surprised, he, honestly, there's ne not a Never Been Kissed convention because it's kind of one of those cult, yeah, cult followings yeah. too. 
Yeah, it definitely does. It definitely. Well, cool. Well, uh, jumping into the last few things uh, that we got going on here, um, you had you played uh, Neil uh, Froger in uh, in the yeah. good old Lost uh, toward the yeah. end of the Lost uh, series. So when you got on that, which basically is at that time was like the Who Shot Jr. of like the anticipation yeah. and mystery. So like when you were on the show, were you like a fan before you got on, or were you just huge fan i was a huge fan before and in fact i watched the episode you know end of may june where you know they're in the lifeboat and the island disappears and then you know six weeks later i'm in the lifeboat <laughs> that's got to be it, surreal like it, crazy it, so i'm not kidding that's the time that it felt like i just crawled inside my television set it was the strangest feeling really it was like oh my god i'm here in that boat that I just watched, it was that was crazy. Well, that then was, also, have you been on TV shows that had like that much scale and that much like production behind it as well in regards to television? I've been on. I mean, a lot of shows have a big budget. I mean, I was just on Constantine uh, mm -hmm. years ago, and uh, I guess maybe not so the budget, but just like the the intention. Like I said, the anticipation, the, the mystery. Right. Right. No, I mean some shows, uh, but. You know, I've been on Criminal Minds and uh, NYPD Blue and mm -hmm. those kind of things, but not the kind of thing where there's, you know, a weird mystery like that one was. It was crazy. So, yeah, it was not. Did you have uh, friends and family hitting you up with their with details or with their theories yeah. of what might be happening? Yeah, and you're like, I can't tell. You. I can't tell. Yeah, like you just they just should know from day yeah. one. You're not going to give it away. Yeah, you you can't say anything. Well, cool. Okay, so, so, do you still get recognized? So, uh, like that one was such a huge show. Do people still call you either? Call Froger. There you are. Yeah, I did actually. <laughs> uh, after my divorce, I dated a woman for like a couple months who mm -hmm. wrecked me from that. <laughs> so, <laughs> is that a little interesting when you, if you do get in the dating or somebody just happens to call you from a, a character name from years back or a character you're just like, I, who are you calling to me? Yeah, 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 yeah. That, I mean, not really. That didn't that didn't happen that much, actually. But it was just interesting that, like, I was trying to think of people who recognized me. I was like, oh, that's right. But uh, I uh, most of the my girlfriend now we've been together for several years is that she came to a convention, and that was the first thing I asked her. I was like, you didn't come to this convention to meet me, did you? And she goes, no. I, my friend and I came. Because we, you know, we want to get out of town and we want to party. Mm -hmm. A couple of our people we'd like to say hello to. I was like, good, because I don't want to date a fan. <laughs> uh, you get, you got to have those pre, those like pre-screen yeah. questions always. Hey, yeah, the screening questions. Hey, but I have friends who's they've they've met their husbands and had their families with fans who started as fans, but then they really got to know them. So you never hey, know. Hey, with everything, it has both sides, some good and some bad. Sometimes they all work out, sometimes they don't. Can't yeah. can't base it off one thing. Well, just yeah. kind of talking about Comic-Cons real quick, and then we'll get into our last thing. So you do uh, the Comic-Con circuit here and there. You go to different cities. Well, as many Comic-Cons as horror conventions. I do horror mostly. Oh, okay. Under the stairs. I've done a couple of Comic-Cons, but mostly it's um, the the horror and, and that – group because people under the stairs and then i did idle hands and i did mm -hmm. um uh a lot, lot of different movies in the hatchet series so you fit right in that genre pretty and, easily uh, yeah, so i've been fitting into that genre and then when you do that more than you get exposure in the horror genre and then you get more of that work so it kind of it's kind of an interesting goes hand in hand yeah well then, what what do you like to do when you go to like the horror cons and things like that? In your spare time, do you walk around? Do you go chill out? First of all, you don't get a lot of spare time. Mm -hmm. You like fly in, get your stuff ready, go to work, go to a VIP party. You know, uh, people who know me from those things know that I love I karaoke. I sing karaoke and I love to dance with everybody. So that's that's what I love to do for fun. With those and then uh, and um, yeah. Then you work all day Saturday, work all day Sunday, and you get on a plane and come home. So it's crazy. You party Friday, Saturday night afterwards, and meet everybody, and then you go home. That was that was my next one. So there are any special after after the con celebrity parties that the common folk they are have, unaware of? Yeah, they'll have VIP parties for people who paid for VIP tickets where you show up. And, 
and they'll have karaoke and things like that. So. Oh, okay. Well, ha- I think I might have to start saving up for some of these VIP tickets. <laughs> yeah. I've been missing out karaoke with some uh, some of our are- favorites. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're really fun. Horror conventions are super fun. Well, cool, cool. Yeah, just I always kind of wondered what the schedule was like, or kind of what the routine would be like going to one of those. Uh, you know, as a celebrity, like, yeah. And out, and you, unless you come in Thursday, my girlfriend and I like get in Thursday, and then we'd uh, do something in the town. Like in Lexington, we went to a horse farm, and in mm-hmm. Massachusetts, we went to the Dr. Seuss Sculpture Garden, and we tried to do something because it's like. This is it, you know. Yeah, this is my only chance to do something on Friday before the show. Is once Friday hits, you're just working, and even after you're working because you're meeting people and you know going to the parties and stuff like that. So kissing babies, it never ends. Exactly. <laughs> well, cool, cool. Well, one of the last things I wanted to go over is that uh, you're currently at James Franco's Acting and Film School as the improv instructor for actors. So, what was the process of you know earning this unique opportunity working uh, with James Franco School? Uh, well, I, uh, his creative director, Sean Barnes, a guy I went to acting class together. And look, people always ask me, what do you tell people uh, who are starting out? I'll say two things. One, create your own content. I created a play called Psyche on Vine, which has got a permanent run in Hollywood through 2018. So if you're in the L.A. area, you can come see me in a comedy play that I co-wrote and star in. Um, and then the other thing I say is be cool to work with. So 25 years ago, I was an acting class with this guy now he's running the creative director of the school i went in there and i did a six-week program it was received so well they asked me to do another one that was received so well they asked me to do another one and then i said let's just do this full time yeah. so i had the department and it's really fun and so we do an improv shows and we do written sketch comedy shows so well, cool. uh yeah, it's really, really great. So um, what's the process for someone who maybe is interested in like joining your class or you know joining at the school you, itself? Yeah, you can audit my class for free. You just go to studio4la.com or James Franco School. You can put it in. And there's a section that says audit. And you can come and you sit in a class. But anyone who comes to my class doesn't sit down. They participate with us. They play with us. And there you go. And then we uh, – then we – um, uh, then you decide if you want to join the class or not. Oh, cool. Really? cool. So if I ha- if happen to be, someone have to be, if I happen to be or somebody's visiting LA and they want to just come in for a one off, they can do that. Absolutely. Yep. Well, awesome. That's, that sounds awesome. Cause ho- I'm thinking about being in LA in, in uh, next year sometime. So you may be seeing me sneak into your, one of your classes. I, I better see you coming to my class. Perfect. Well, it's going to happen. Well, awesome. So on top of doing this with James Franco school, I know you have other talents in regards to production roles. What else do you do, you know, behind the scenes? Well, I, like I said, I, I'm, I, I co-wrote and produced, um, uh, this play that, and that I'm putting on. Uh, and starring in, uh, I am teacher. I'm a looper. That means you do you do ADR stuff behind the scenes on a couple of my friends' shows. I am uh, currently uh, starting a self taping business where I'll coach you to do self taping. Um, I am a gosh, I have so many different things. I'm a coach. I have a, st- a student coming soon. Uh, to coach with me. I'm a landlord. I own a couple properties in, in the East Coast. Like I do a ton of stuff. And now I'm going to start uh, a charity that I'll have to get in touch with you when I'm about to promote it because I want to get good promotion for it. Yeah, definitely get that out there. So busy for you is an understatement then. Yeah, yeah but I'm happier than I've ever been. So it's That's great. great. I'm the same way. I mean, I full-time job doing the podcast and some other side things. <laughs> Staying busy, keeping your mind busy, I think is keeps you a little younger, at least keeps you on your toes. 100%, man. 100%. For sure. Well, well awesome. Well, Sean, like I said, you're always a busy man. What are your upcoming projects and uh, what that you want to promote and where can people find you on social media to follow all these things? Uh, get, follow me on Sean M. Whalen. Just friend request me on Sean M. Whalen. I put everything up on there. I have these caption contests that I do that are really fun. Um, uh, I am, gosh, I'm directing uh, the comedy improv show and the written show at James Franco School. You can go to Studio 4LA to see, you know, when the comedy shows are coming up. 
I'm starring in this play in Psyche on Vine. Um, I'm working with a producer from China, and we I wrote a movie called Crust. It's a comedy horror movie that I'm producing that and creating a Western uh, that I'm producing or writing and hopefully going to work with this woman as well, making that. Um, and I just got booked on School of Rock, as you heard. Literally on the show. <laughs> on the show. So, uh, we can all say we're a part of the process, folks. If, uh, if you go to Netflix, you can see me on uh, a movie called Street Level. A guy named David Labrava from Sons of Anarchy wrote and directed a movie. It's one of my favorite dramatic roles. I play a serial killer. Um, a great, fun horror movie called The Axe Murderers of Villisca. Um, that's on there as well. And. Pretty soon I'm coming out in Death House, which is one of the most anticipated horror movies of this year because it's like the Expendables for horror people. Very so, cool. Yeah, so things are going things are going well. Oh, things. yeah. Well, awesome, awesome. Well, John, like I said, you always sound very busy, so everybody follow him on social media to keep up with everything that yeah. he's in. And don't don't forget to check the IMDb because, like I said, you know, you have seen him in something that you didn't think you'd seen him in. So it's like a, it's like a they should make a board game, Sean Whalen. Did you see Sean Whalen in this yeah. movie? Yeah, exactly. That should literally be a board game. Well, Sean, thank you so much. I, I definitely appreciate you taking the time for coming on today. Uh, we're definitely going to get – we're going to do some promotions for the charity once we get that information going and go from there. So, again, thank you. Well, but. Thank you. Yeah, thanks everyone for tuning you into this. Homework, which is very cool. Thank you. It, I mean, when, when you when you grow up watching it, it didn't take that much homework, but I do appreciate that. Uh, but for everybody else, thanks for tuning into this episode of the Be Kind and Rewind podcast. Subscribe, like, follow, and rate the podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, Spreaker, and YouTube. But don't forget to find the episodes on Poop Culture Network website at poopculture.com, along with other stellar podcasts as well. So thanks everybody, and be excellent to each other. <laughs>